Good morning to everybody, and uh, welcome to the United States Sentencing Commission's public hearing on the report and recommendations of the Tribal Issues Advisory Group, whom we call TIAG. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all our witnesses, some of whom I know, who um, traveled far to be here today, and to the public audience that joins us both here in Washington, D.C. We're pleased to have so many people from the public and also by live stream via the internet. We look forward to a um, thoughtful and engaging discussion about this important subject. Today we will hear testimony that summarizes the important work of the TIAG over the past year and a half, which culminated in the publication of the TIAG report last month. The report is available to everyone on the Commission website. I look forward to hearing from our distinguished witnesses which include federal judges, tribal law experts, and tribal members who bring together their perspectives from Indian country. The Commission is incredibly grateful to the witnesses who are here today and for all the TIAG members for their dedication to these top their topics and for their hard work on behalf of the Commission over the past several months. I'm sure we'll hear about it, but they've met not just in Washington, D.C., but more importantly, I think they've been um, in, in Bismarck, uh, the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota, the Pakra Yaki Reservation in Arizona, and, um, and, and, and that was important to, to the work of TIAG. Uh, the Commission formed the TIAG um, in February 2015 to study the impact of the sentencing guidelines on Native American defendants, victims, and tribal communities, and to make recommendations on sentencing and policy reforms based on the TIAG's analysis. The Commission charged the TIAG with studying certain topics, such as sentencing disparities and the use of tribal court convictions in the calculation of criminal history. The Commission also left open the possibility for the TIAG to study any other issues relating to criminal justice in Indian Country, and it's done so. The result is that the TIAG report includes recommendations for concrete amendments to the sentencing guidelines, as well as requests for further study by the Commission and for legislative and policy reform by lawmakers in the criminal justice community. It also highlights the need for more data in certain areas. We will hear about the specifics of those recommendations in just a few moments. Let me remind the public audience on a different subject about where we are in the amendment cycle. Just last month on June 9th, the Commission published its proposed priorities for the upcoming year. Uh, you can find a full um, listing of those priorities on our website and in the Federal Register. The publication of those priorities triggered a public comment period, which will close on July 25th. Let me repeat that, July 25th, next Monday. We hope to hear not only from today's witnesses, uh, but also from members of the general public about the um, Commission's response to the TIAG report. We also welcome comment um, on any of our proposed priorities and about any other topics you would like us to address during this amendment cycle. So let's get going. First, I'd like to introduce our vice chair, Judge Charles R. Breyer. You don't see him, but he's here with us. He's on the telephone. Um, and can you hear us? Yes, I can, okay. and I'm, I'm with you audibly. Audio and in spirit. Okay. Um, he's a senior um, district judge for the Northern District of California and has, has served as a United States district judge since 1998. He joined the commission in 2013. Right next to me is Rachel Barco, who joined the commission in 2013. She's the Siegel Family Professor of Re Regulatory Law and Policy at the New York University School of Law, where she focuses her um, attention on teaching and research in criminal and administrative law. She also serves as the faculty director of the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law at the Law School. Next to her is Commissioner Barco, uh, to Commissioner Barco is Dabney Friedrich, uh, who has served, also now from California, who served on the commission since 2006. Immediately prior to her appointment to the commission, she served as an associate counsel at the White House. She served as counsel to Chairman Orrin Hatch of the United States Senate Judiciary Committee and as an assistant United States uh, attorney first for the Southern District of California and then for the Eastern District of Virginia. And far um, to the end of the table here is Judge William H. Pryor, um, a United States Circuit Judge for the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals appointed in 2004. Um, before his appointment to the federal bench, Judge Pryor served as Attorney General for the state of Alabama he joined the commission in 2013. 
Finally, to on my left is Michelle Morales, who served as the designated ex officio member of the commission representing the Department of Justice. She is the acting director of the Office of Policy and Legislation in the criminal division of the, of the department. She first joined that office in 2002 and has served as its deputy director since 2009. She previously served as an assistant United States attorney in the District of Puerto Rico. So now let me discuss for a minute the format of today. Um, this is um, not our usual time for the commission to start a public hearing. We're usually here bright and early at 8.30 or 9 o'clock, but we realize that so many people here um, um, live uh, <clears throat> and are interest who are interested in this come from the West Coast that we and from uh, the and a large portion of the Indian country population might want to chime in. So what we decide to do is start this later in the day, which I think is pleasing to everyone in this room. So um, our hearing will begin with a presentation of the TIAG report and a summary of the drafting process. And after that, we'll hear from each of the, uh, I think there were four substantive TIAG subcommittees about their recommendations, followed by closing remarks. So we have asked each witness to limit their remarks to roughly 10 minutes. Usually we have these lights that go off. Um, we don't have the lights today. Um, nonetheless, you still have my hook if, if things go on a little too long. But um, the topic is so interesting, we've decided um, to uh, start with the judges here who know the most uh, about it. We will take a short break in the middle, and throughout the hearing, the commission will ask questions, and we'll jump in um, on topics. We're, we're not a shy group. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. And I start off um, with our first panel, which will provide an overview of the TIAG and the drafting process, and it's comprised of two federal judges from Indian country who are well known to us. Uh, Judge Ralph. Erickson is the chair of the TIAG and chief United States District Judge of the District of North Dakota. Dakota, we've heard um, from Judge Erickson before on other topics. He just came to our training session, and um, we welcome you back. And Judge um, Roberto A. Lane, um, who we call Bob, <laughs> chaired the drafting subcommittee for the TIAG, which means we can thank him for the monumental task of putting the report together. I don't know why Judge Lane came back here. Um, the last time he came and testified in front of us, he got stuck in a snowstorm over Valentine's Day and wasn't home with his family. So it I made don't know. me feel at home coming from South Dakota. Yeah. <laughs> so I thank you for risking it coming back. We tried for the summer so this wouldn't happen to you again. And, and welcome back. The floor is yours, Judge Eric. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to start off by just thanking the commission for the opportunity to serve uh, in this capacity. Um, I will start by telling you what I told the members of the TIAG when we first met at the very first meeting, and that is, is that I fundamentally, and from the deepest part of my heart, believe this is the most important professional work I have ever done and am likely ever to do in my career as a federal judge. And I say that with full knowledge that every day I make decisions that deeply impact people's lives. But the reality of uh, the relationship between the tribal nations and the United States and the relationship between the United States Sentencing Commission and sentencing in Indian country is such that this is a once in the life in a lifetime opportunity to work together to improve the quality of life or for tribal people in a way uh, that can make a substantial difference. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the opportunity for our commission, our committee, to go about this very important work. I also want to thank you for the time and the effort that you put into selecting a diverse group of people who brought to the TIAG a broad background. Um, if you think about the group of people that uh, you selected for, for us to work to, with, uh, you gave us five United States judges, uh, a representative from the Department of the Interior, two representatives from the Department of Justice, um, a representative from the Office of the Federal Public Defenders, a tribal chairman, two tribal judges, a member of the Nevada Indian uh, Commission, a victim specialist with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, three academics, a uh, tribal council, a private practitioner, a retired tribal police chief and director of public safety, and liaisons from the practitioner's advisory group, the probation officer's advisory group, and the victim's advisory group. All of these people have been very active 
in Indian country issues over a period of years. All of them were known to me by at least reputation. And when I read their writings, they staked out a broad diversity of opinions and background. And when uh, Chair uh, Saras asked me to, to take this position, I agreed because I could think of no reason that it was possible to say no. But I did so with great trepidation because these were committed people who had a long-standing history in Indian country and who were extremely committed uh, to uh, moving forward. And with that broad diversity of strong opinions, I was quite fearful that it might be hard to build uh, a consensus. What I found instead was that you had selected a group of people that shared two fundamental traits that I think are important as we think about sentencing in Indian country. Number one, each of them was, con uh, was uh, committed to recognizing, understanding, and fostering the pre-constitutional nature of these sovereign governments and these sovereign people, and they were committed in doing what was best for the people who lived in Indian country. I probably should explain that Indians and Indian country, while not politically correct terms, are terms of art and they are in the statute, and that's why we refer to those, uh, um, the, those titles. The group of people you gave me to work with were absolutely phenomenal. I have never worked with a group of people that were better in my entire life. I say the same thing about the staff. There was no task that we asked them to undertake that they didn't uh, undertake with uh, um, uh, great alacrity and with uh, tremendous skill and perseverance. We kept asking, we kept pushing, we kept asking for, for things that maybe were not very fair, and yet they responded cheerfully and to the best of their efforts, they got all the information that was necessary. You should be justly proud of the people that you employ. They are fantastic to a person. Now, our group met uh, um, monthly, and uh, we met uh, three times in person. We met once here uh, in Washington, D.C., once in North Dakota, spending time at the Standing Rock Reservation and in Bismarck, and we met once in Arizona at the Pascawaki uh, Reservation. We had an opportunity to see uh, tribal uh, governments function uh, and to get information from our uh, experiences in holding those hearings. We also held a um, uh, uh, consultation where we invited uh, Indian people from around the country uh, to uh, contribute to our work. Um, the the uh, uh, people who report from the substantive committees are going to talk at more detail about both those things, so I won't go into great detail about it. But I think it's important for us to understand that Indian nations are in a trust relationship with the United States. They are pre-constitutional sovereigns. They have uh, an interest that is unlike anything else that exists <laughs> in our legal system. And consultation and respect for their customs and traditions is inherent in the, any type of sentencing process that we want to consider. And we think it's extremely important that, uh, that uh, uh, those uh, um, efforts continue to be of paramount importance to the Commission. The way that the committee was organized, we formed four substantive uh, working groups. We had a working group that was the Tribal Federal Working Group. We had the Tribal Court Convictions, Criminal History, Court Protection Orders Working Group. We had the Sentencing Disparities Working Group. We had a Juvenile Justice, Youthful Offenders, Crimes Against Children Working Group. Each of the substantive committees met uh, at least monthly, uh, in addition to the monthly meetings that were uh, um, held telephonically or in person. And so over this 18-month period, we have gotten to know each other exceptionally well. And uh, a lot of hard work was done. I'm proud of the report. I think that it pulls together uh, a broad diversity of opinion. And I am exceptionally proud of the fact that we were able to uh, uh, produce a report that has not uh, resulted in any minority reports or minority positions, which is difficult when you look at the uh, interests that each uh, party represents. And I want to thank from the bottom of my heart the members of the TIAG for being willing to sacrifice their own personal stakeholder interests um, to uh, look towards doing what was best for the people of Indian country. I think that uh, um, that's um, 
really a summary of, of what we did. My time is nearly up, um, but I do want to add one last thing. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Judge Myron Bright of the Eighth Circuit. He's a 98-year-old senior judge. He called me to his chambers at the beginning of this week, and he wanted to tell me that there's something that I should bring to you. And uh, I told him I would do so, and, and I do so because I think it's important uh, as a piece of, I, of information. What he wanted me to point out was that the lack of statistical data should not be confused with a lack of evidence and that the fact that there is anecdotal evidence and evidence from opinions uh, and evidence from people who reside in Indian country that they believe that there is significant sentencing disparity, um, that that's important because it's nearly universally held as a belief. And as we traveled around Indian country, it seems that everyone believes that there is some sentencing disparity. When we first started this process, one of the things that I hoped to discover was each of us works in Indian country, but we each work with two or three uh, tribal nations. And as a result, we have a sort of a, a, a deep experience in Indian country, but a narrow experience. And the question that we are confronted with frequently is whether or not our personal experiences are normative or whether or not they are parochial. And one of the things that we were looking for statistical data for was to answer that question. Because we do know that while there's universal accord that sentencing disparity exists, there is not universal um, uh, um, acceptance as to what that disparity is. In some parts of the country, there's a perception that the disparity is that federal sentences are short, and in some, uh, that they're long. And you know, in our part of the world, it's firmly believed that the Indian country sentences are uniformly long. Um, it is also true that in the Southwest, there's a more of a split. And, you know, um, the inability to get the data has made that difficult for us to, to, to really tease out. Our hope is, is that at some point the data can be developed in a way that allows us to tease those things out. Having said that, I don't want to distract from the meaningful work that we have accomplished and that we have recommended some concrete changes uh, to the uh, sentencing guidelines, which we think are important. We have recommended some things that only Congress can fix, and the question becomes is how do we move forward from here? And um, we have also identified at least one issue with juvenile and youthful offenders that we think is much broader than just an Indian country issue, although for juvenile offenders, they are primarily Indian country juveniles that we see. Um, I think I've gone on longer than I should. I want to just once again close by thanking you, and I'll let uh, Judge Lang um, explain to you the drafting process. All right. Thank you, Judge Erickson. I want to echo Judge Erickson's gratitude to the Commission and to the members of the TIAG for the work that was done. Uh, drafting for a group of 20 different committee members is a challenge, and uh, I did not do it alone. There was a drafting committee that I worked with uh, comprised of representatives of all four of the working groups, uh, Diane Humitua, who's a district court judge in the District of Arizona, and Neil Fulton, the federal public defender for North and South Dakota, uh, represented the group that dealt with the tribal court convictions. Uh, Bill Boyum, who is a, a Supreme Court judge for the Cherokee Nation, worked with me from the tribal federal working group. Mike Cotter, who's U.S. attorney in the District of Montana, represented the sentencing disparities group and Angela Campbell, who's a private practitioner, worked for the juvenile justice group. We formed relatively early um, in the process and did the status update for all of you uh, late last year. Uh, we chose to do the status update reporting from the four uh, working groups, and that became the format, as you see in the final report of the uh, TIAG. Uh, the final report initially was drafted after our Arizona meeting in February. Uh, the committee did some of the work. Uh, some of the work was from the various working groups as well. There was a process, as you'd expect, of, it going, of the drafts going back to the working groups for uh, feedback, other revisions that were done. Ultimately, this was presented to the entire uh, TIAG in March, uh, or excuse me, in April. Uh, with final revisions then. The sentencing disparity uh, section was the latest to come together because there was 
uh, some delay in, and some hope that there would be further data that could be used uh, to make more specific recommendations. Ultimately, the final draft was approved in May. I would say that uh, this draft represents a consensus of all of the members. There is one uh, place, and that is the treatment of tribal court convictions, where I think it's more appropriate to describe it as a substantial majority uh, joining in that uh, recommendation. But it was uh, an interesting process, uh, one that I had a great deal of help with. And in particular, I would like to thank Nicole Snyder for her, her help in this regard. Uh, she and my judicial assistant, Leslie Hicks, did uh, much of the work uh, in terms of just making sure the changes got made. And um, I think as a group, we're uh, comfortable and proud of the final outcome. Is there any questions? Thanks very much for this report, which is excellent. So it's okay if we're on the topic of the report, if we want to. Yes, although I Aren't think we're going to have the, uh, sub, the subcommittees are going to come present on, on I, I think, right on the substance right, of recommendations. Right. I just want to, I guess I wanted to get a little bit of a sense of the majority in favor of the use of tribal convictions. I guess that if there were a spectrum of views from the group, to the extent there wasn't absolute unanimity, what kinds of things might have been the source of the, where you well, I, I get think, complete consensus, I guess. Yeah, let, let, me, let me address that. If it's okay that. to ask. Is that, yeah, I, I think that if we look at the inner workings of the Although committee. I think we'll probably hear about it again, right? Yeah, we will. And I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quite brief on this. I think that if you think about uh, what happens with uh, tribal court convictions, there, there really are two fundamental questions that come to play. The first question is, what are the attributes of tribal sovereignty that are tied up in the tribal courts? And what dignity should be afforded to the tribal courts and the tribal court judgments? And right now, we treat them as we would foreign courts. And so um, there's that issue. And so there is a concern among some of our members, a minority, that would put a higher priority on the uh, tribal uh, court dignity. There's another group of people that, um, and this would be a clear majority you know, of the committee, nearly two-thirds, not quite, that says, well, you know, the problem with that is that tribal courts are very different. There are over 500 tribal nations, over 300 tribal courts. The tribal courts range from being very traditional, in which there would be very few uh, uh, parameters set that we would recognize as being consonant with the ordinary due process in a Western system. They range to a set of tribal courts that are very nearly Western in their nature and have a full panoply of due process rights. And frankly, they function at as high or higher a level of due process as any state court. And what happens with all of us who serve in this capacity is we come from different areas where we have different experiences. And it depends on what the courts look like where you are. Now, amongst the majority, there was a concern that if we just said all tribal convictions should score, regardless, that there would be a tendency to have much higher uh, criminal history scores, and it would exacerbate the uh, disparity that already exists in Indian country sentencing. On the other side, there was a recognition, while that may be possible, that it was not consonant or consistent with uh, tribal uh, dignity as sovereign nations to not treat their convictions um, with that type of dignity. As we went about the business of resolving it, and you'll hear a lot more about it, we drafted what we perceive to be a way to make it work for every single tribe because it gives the district judge the opportunity to really evaluate the tribal courts that have imposed those uh, prior judgments and, um, and, what, and, and how, how they should be viewed. The other thing that you just should be aware of is that the tribal courts uh, have a broad variation between the nature of the record keeping that they have, some of which have fantastic records, better or as good as any state in the union. Others keep almost no records. You could write them on the back of a matchbook cover. And so that's a problem. Did I answer the question, Bob? Absolutely. And I would add to that some tribes do provide uh, criminal history to the pre-sentence writers. Some tribes will not do so because they have a sense that their members are being treated too harshly. And I happen to have 
four, sometimes five uh, tribes that uh, have members whom I routinely sentence. And I have both situations. I have one tribe that will not provide criminal history on defendants at all. Some tribes that do, so that would create a disparity if it's counted uniformly in my own case law. And I think it was unanimous among the five federal judges that it ought not to be automatically counted, but rather the sort of uh, guidance uh, for where an upward departure is appropriate in criminal history category. Thank you. I, I know you've emphasized the importance of consultation, and, uh, and, and I've been thrilled that you've gone um, into Indian country and that uh, basically such a broad array of people were consulted as part of this report. As, as we as a commission go forward, uh, it, it, the, the issue of consultation is daunting because there are so many tribes and there are 500 tribes and probably, as you say, all, huge swaths of the country, different regions with different points of view. What, what, is, what kinds of things would you think consultation should involve and how? Well, we consulted with uh, every uh, recognized, federally recognized tribe was given notice, uh, as well as other people who are academics interested in Indian country. We sent out notice. We had the cooperation of the Department of Interior Bureau of Indian Affairs in sending a notice, and we held a telephone consultation, which actually we felt was uh, uh, really uh, very yeah. useful. We heard from a number of people from around the country, uh, and so I think that that's a tool that you can use on a on a you know with more routine matters. If in, like a list service, is it? Is yeah, well, it was a it was just a. Nicole can probably <laughs> answer this. But I, for us, it looked like a big, giant conference call um, where we were all in different parts of the, uh, the country uh, on our telephones and, and uh, um, answering questions. And I'm afraid that the technology piece was sort of beyond me. But I, I, uh, I called the, the consultation to order. I made a brief statement. People ask questions from all over the country, some of whom I know, some of whom I don't know. Um, and. Uh, uh, we had a number of uh, people from the, and really we're kind of stealing the thunder of the federal uh, committee, uh, and so I should let them explain okay. it. But but we we um, we answered the questions and and uh, they made statements, and it was really a uh, really a very kind of uh, for us relatively painless. You'll have to ask your staff how painful it was for them because it they sure made it look painless from where we sat, you know. I do think that there are issues that are uniquely tied to Indian country that really the commission ought to consider uh, meeting uh, in one of the larger uh, Indian country states when those sorts of issues come to bear. Um, because I do think that, for example, uh, if you look at it, you know, if you decide to change the, the sexual assault guidelines, you know, almost all the sexual assault cases that we see in federal court come out of Indian country, and it has unique application there, um, you know, and, and, we ought, and we ought to look at, at consulting on a more direct basis there. And if you think about the, the, the Indian nations, some of them are huge, and it becomes relatively uh, easy to identify where it might take, uh, make sense to, to hold a field hearing. But, but you know, on the ordinary run-of-the-mill kinds of things that, that affect Indian country that are not sort of substantial changes, it seems to me that this sort of uh, telephonic consultation would be appropriate. Else? Any other All right. well, thank you very much. Uh, for our next panel, we will hear recommendations from two of the TIAG subcommittees. First, we will again hear from Judge um, Roberto Lang about the recommendation of the TIAG's Tribal Federal Working Group. Next, we will hear from the co-chairs of the Tribal Court Convictions and Court Protection Orders Subcommittee. Barbara Creel is Professor of Law at the University of North New Mexico School of Law, where she directs the Southwest Indian Law Clinic. Ms. Creel is also a member of the Pueblo um, Hem 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 Hemet. Hemet's tribe. Um, Brent Leonard is the tribal attorney for the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. We welcome you. Thank you for coming such a long distance, and we're excited to hear your comments. Thank you. Uh, for this, um, <clears throat> Judge Erickson is staying as, his, as the, um, uh, somebody to ask questions of, and he'll be here to take, um, to chime in. 
So welcome to all of you. So I don't know if you've agreed which, which uh, order to go in? Yes, uh, Judge Lang is going to uh, present on behalf of the Tribal and Federal Working Group. I would just note that uh, Judge Morris from the District of Montana and uh, Judge Boyum, uh, who's on the Supreme Court of the Eastern Band of Cherokee uh, Indians, uh, are both uh, unavailable to be here, and they were the chairs of this working group. But uh, Bob was on the working group, and so Judge Lang. Thank you, Judge Erickson. Uh, in addition to Judge Morris and Judge Boyum on this working group were Wendy Bremer, who was with the BIA as a victim's assistant, Kevin Washburn, who was at the uh, Department of the Interior and now I believe is at the University of New Mexico. Fascinating guy. Really enjoyed Kevin. And uh, Tracy Tulu, who is with the Department of Justice. I think it's important uh, to be mindful in uh, discussing a tribal-federal working relationship uh, of the history that exists uh, in this nation of the treatment of Native Americans and uh, tribe, tribal groups. It has been a history uh, where the federal government has imposed its will, for the most part, on Native Americans and on tribes rather than uh, working together and consulting together. Uh, there is an outline uh, that I believe was submitted separately uh, regarding the, the history. I won't belabor that. That's not our uh, purpose uh, in being here. But with that background, uh, the, this working group thought uh, that it would be a valuable recommendation to the Sentencing Commission uh, to consider a standing advisory group on uh, Native American issues and on Indian sentencing. Uh, we began by calling this the mini TIAG idea. Uh, uh, your, uh, our charter uh, included no more than 20 members, and we thought a group of six to eight uh, individuals uh, with a cross section of a federal judge, a Department of Interior, Department of Justice representative, federal public defender, tribal judge, and a couple of at large members, hopefully uh, Native Americans, would be a good cross section to work with. And the idea of that group would be to not only advise the Sentencing Commission on issues that particularly affect uh, Indian country, but also perhaps to help or actually do consultation uh, with uh, Indian tribes, um, as was done by uh, the TIAG as a whole. Uh, the thought then was that perhaps every decade or so, uh, there could be a reformulation of a group like this. Uh, to study, in particular, uh, possible sentencing disparities and make recommendations for changes in the guidelines. As you know from reading the report, and we'll hear later, uh, the TIAG was frustrated with the absence of uh, the ability to do uh, good comparisons uh, of possible sentencing disparities. And then the other suggestion that uh, Judge Erickson has mentioned, uh, the consideration of uh, having hearings in or near Indian country for uh, issues or revisions of the guidelines that particularly affect uh, Indian country. Uh, there were some more general recommendations that this group came up with. Uh, this was a very wide thinking group about uh, how uh, we could improve relations with uh, tribes and, and uh, Native Americans generally. And I know there's been some communication between Judge Erickson and the FJC and AO about establishing a working group. Uh, some of uh, the federal judges discussed mentoring new judges who would take the bench in Indian country districts. And there was discussion also about uh, the uh, encouraging uh, greater law enforcement uh, in Indian country where uh, non-Indians, whites, non-Indians uh, offend against Indians, possibly even through encouraging uh, greater use of misdemeanor or CVBs. And that's the uh, summary of the Tribal Federal Working Group recommendations. Any questions related to that? I think what we'll do is just take everybody and then we, we jump in and out. That way we, we get through everybody. Is that okay? That's fine. Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, the next uh, report will come from the Tribal Convictions and Protection Orders Working Group. Uh, Brent and Barbara will report uh, on that. Um, I don't know if you figured out who's going to speak I first. Think I'll go first. All right. Uh, the one thing I would say, if I've misspoken on anything and it needs to be corrected, feel free to correct me at any time. Okay. Great. Very good. 
So I'm Brent Leonard. I'm an attorney with the Office of Legal Counsel for the Confederated Tribes of the Indian Reservation. By way of background, I've been a state prosecutor, head of prosecution unit, White Mountain Apache, head uh, public defender of Colville Tribe, and a special assistant United States attorney in Arizona and Oregon. Umatilla was the first jurisdiction in the nation, along with the state of Ohio, to implement sex offender registration under the Adam Walsh Act. It was the first tribe to implement felony sentencing under Tribal Law, Law and Order Act 2010, and the first tribe, along with Tulalip and possibly Yaki, to uh, be authorized to exercise criminal jurisdiction authority over non-Indians uh, in domestic violence cases under BAWA. So, there's a great deal of interest and concern about public safety in Indian country, and coming into this, this group, uh, on these issues, uh, my position has been strongly that tribal court convictions should be considered automatically in, in calculating sentences the same way as state court convictions because if you go to Umatilla Tribal Court, all the due process that are given them are the same you'll find in any municipal or state court system, if not more. Um, and, and it doesn't matter if it's a felony, misdemeanor, Indian, non-Indian. We give them all the same rights. And in fact, anybody who wants an attorney gets an attorney whether or not they're, they they have the income. Um, so there's a great deal uh, that you'll find in tribal court that um, uh, provides all the protections you'd be concerned about. Um, however, coming into this group, it was immediately apparent within our subcommittee um, that there's a broad diversity of views from people from di broad diversity of uh, uh, backgrounds uh, and, in fact, uh, diametrically opposed positions. And we were tasked with trying to come to a consensus uh, on a recommendation for the commission. And uh, uh, from our subgroup, I think we did. Um, it was a difficult task. Um, TIAG as a whole, I think the majority did. So the recommendation is that instead of automatically counting under 4A1.2, uh, to continue to allow for enhancements under 4A1.3, however, give some guidelines to federal judges as to what to look for in those circumstances. And there are five uh, factors that we've laid out. One is whether or not due process, like the U.S. Constitution, due process rights have been guaranteed. Second is if the conviction uh, itself was pursuant to Tribal Law and Order Act or VAWA 2013. Those mandate that all of those due process, uh, federal constitutional due process rights are, are in place. Third is whether or not uh, it's already been counted. So you can have tribal court uh, crime occur on the reservation, tribe prosecutes it, gets a conviction, and then the feds later take it and get a conviction for the same crime. Shouldn't be counted twice. Uh, fourth is um, whether or not if it were a state conviction, it would have been counted it's under 4, uh, A 1.2. So uh, public intoxication, those sorts of crimes wouldn't be counted. And fifth is I think the most important one to me, um, it reflects a real um, uh, a real understanding of tribal nations and a real respect for tribal nations. And that is what the tribal nation itself would like done with its own court convictions. I think that's they're the most capable of deciding whether or not it's appropriate. They're the most likely to reflect what the community wants and expects and they're from the local jurisdiction where these occurred. So I, I think that's a very important factor. However, our group has not made any one factor determinative. Uh, it is an exhaustive, but I think those are helpful factors for any federal judge to look to. Um, so we've made that recommendation. In regard to um, protection orders, it was a, um, a difficult issue as well. I mean, as to whether there should be enhancements for categorical or for particular crimes based on a violation, underlying violation of protection order, it's a much larger issue than TA to address. Um, and don't feel terribly comfortable addressing that directly. On the question of whether that will disparately impact uh, Indian defendants in the federal system, uh, the reality is we just don't have any data. Uh, we don't know how many tribal court convictions get considered, how they're considered, uh, if, if it's consistent in obtaining them, any of that. So our recommendation is to pursue more data so that that can be looked at in, in, in the future. However, there is one recommendation, um, and that is to actually define what a protection order is under the federal guidelines. Uh, and it's a simple way to do it, and it would uh, treat state, tribal, and territorial uh, protection orders equally. So. The, the definition would refer back to 18 U.S.C. 2266, which is a definition of um, 
protection order under the full faith and credit provisions of stat, uh, federal statute, as well as 2265, which guarantees due process uh, was in place for those protections, which is really simple of jurisdiction, notice, and opportunity to be heard. I, I think those um, are reasonable things. And I think that would be helpful in making it very clear that tribal state and federal, or tribal state and territorial um, protection orders are treated equally. So that's what I have to present. I want to thank you for, for allowing me to be part of this group. It was a diverse group. It was insightful for me to hear from people who are just as passionate on these issues and diametrically opposed to my positions. So <laughs> it, was, it was good. Professor Creel. Thank you. I'm Barbara Creel, an enrolled member of the Pueblo of Jemez, one of the 19 Indian Pueblos in New Mexico. As a Native American Indian, I am one of the few people that can be subjected to legal double jeopardy, dual successive prosecutions in tribal and federal court for the same offense. I'm also legally can be uh, denied indigent defense counsel and imprisoned. Also, those uncounseled prior convictions can be used against me in a federal prosecution. Take these ideas, ideals, and try to square them with the United States constitutional principles of due process and the U.S. Sentencing Commission's goals of fairness, to remove disparity, increase predictability, and justice for all. Coupled with the statistics that Native Americans face over incarceration in federal court, juveniles, men, and women outside of our representation in the United States population, as well as the violent crime statistics that we face. Um, both men and women are subjected to violence at a greater rate than any other um, population in the United States. These are not the statistics that define me as a person or my people, but they are a reality in the United States. And my co-counsel or my co-chair um, <laughs> has, has um, deftly uh, tried to explain um, our roles as attorneys and my role as a, an, a former assistant federal public defender and as a mother and a tribal member came into play when I analyzed the data that was given to us by the Sentencing Commission, as well as the cases and um, the stories that we hear from the people in the field. We had sh a, a shared commitment to separate sovereignty, tribal sovereignty, and respect for tribal courts and the work that tribal courts do in prosecuting um, some serious crime on the reservation. I, I, um, tried to decide what word I was going to use. Diametrically opposed kept came coming up for me as well. Um, we were on opposite sides of the spectrum on how to both promote that respect for tribes and tribal sovereignty when you take it outside to a foreign government in the United States. That's when my law professor and my um, federal defender uh, experience kicked in. And looking at the United States Constitution and what is afforded for people who are not citizens of the United States, I thought that Indian citizens should at least have that much. We had some very difficult conversations um, among our, our working group that included Mr. Ed Reyna, who is the Director of Public Safety um, at Tohono O'odham, formerly uh, Judge Diane Humithua, a uh, member of the Hopi Nation, a, a federal defender, uh, Neil Fulton, who saw this work every day um, in tribal and federal court in North and South Dakota, myself, Mr. Leonard, and a victim's advocate, um, Mr. Mike Andrews. And we wrestled with the ideas both um, as our responsibility as attorneys and, and um, representatives of our community, as well as our, um, our other commitments. One of the things that happened, as Judge, Chief Judge Erickson explained, was that tribal sovereignty has gotten tangled up with respect for the decisions of the tribal government. 
what we try to do is untangle those two and look at what the United States Constitution affords to people uh, throughout the United States. And we found um, some help in um, 18 U.S.C. 2265 and 66 that defined the due process that should be afforded for uh, a court order, a protection order. And so our committee's charge to look at tribal convictions, criminal history, and protection orders dovetailed quite well together. And we wanted to afford at least that level of due process for Native Americans when looking at both tribal criminal history and tribal uh, protection orders. I can tell you um, that I do have a deep respect for uh, my sovereign government and their decision making, um, but we have such a vast array of tribes in the United States. According to the National Archives, when the Indian Reorganization Act was passed in 1934, about 200 tribes adopted a constitutional-based um, government um, out of about 360 at the time. And that constitution government mirrored the United States, which is very different than the traditional government that I come from and my people know. Um, the Pueblo of Jemez was under three separate sovereigns, um, Spain, Mexico, and the United States, and has kept their, uh, our government intact throughout um, time. It's very different than a United States mirror constitutional government. And at the time, in 1934, the laws on the books of the United States prohibited attorneys for Indians in courts of federal regulations and in tribal courts. That stayed on the books until 1961. And so we have very different history with the United States and the imposition of what is called justice. I want to thank uh, Judge Erickson um, and Judge Viken for their foresight and for their commitment. When I work with Native people in Indian Country, and there are over half of the federal judicial districts include Indian Country, most of them are in the West, it's really difficult um, to feel like there is justice for all, even the appearance of justice when you see um, the degradation of rights at, under the United States Constitution. And uh, Chief Judge Erickson and Chief, Chief Judge Viken have given me hope that there are people that are endeavoring to understand the issues that tribal people face and um, the difficulty under federal jurisdiction. And I want to also thank my um, co-chair, Brent Leonard, um, for his unwavering commitment to um, the respect given to the Umatilla tribe as well as other tribes that are working very hard um, in Indian country. And um, the other council members or um, committee members who were really um, very adamant and passionate about their positions and they didn't give up. I think our recommendations uh, based on those discussions reflect a really intelligent um, consensus in order to provide due process, um, the kinds of due process rights that all Americans can expect. And I thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to work on the Tribal Issues Advisory Group, and I encourage the Sentencing Commission to continue the work in consultation with tribes throughout the nation. Thank you. Uh, just off the bat, a, a question about if, if you were to look at these factors, uh, and I really, it's, would you put as a minimum that the, the due process rights have been met in backing up the tribal conviction? I mean, is, is that sort of first legally required, in your opinion, and second, um, should as a policy matter, we, nev we never, a judge never consider a conviction unless it had been achieved with the due process? and then get to the other factors? I, I... You know, one of the things, if you just look at what the Indian Civil Rights Act does, it allows prosecutions to move forward in Indian country uh, without certain um, conditions that would seem to us to be very basic. 
right? And so things can happen in Indian country uh, that, is, that, that just wouldn't happen anywhere else. And, and I, in saying that, I want to also remind everyone that there are high-functioning courts that are, as I've said, equal to or frankly much better than state or municipal courts around the country. I mean, uh, from a Western due process model. But if you just think about it, there's no uh, requirement uh, in a tribal court that, uh, um, well, you can have a traditional court in which there's actually no confrontation that actually takes place. Uh, you may have a sentencing circle that involves people sitting down discussing a problem, arriving at a settlement imposed by elders. You may have a court that re requires a religious test in order for someone to be uh, an elder or a judge on that court. I mean, those things happen in Indian country. And they become models that are really very different than anything that we would ordinarily see. That being said, they also bring to the table things that we can learn from. I mean, I'll tell you what, I have learned as much from watching a sentencing circle work and how it brings peace and justice in a way that is different than the Western model, that is of absolute importance to me as a judge, and I have from time to time from the bench uh, engaged in some of those types of conversations to the way that it's possible. I want you to think about, well, this is a personal view, it's not TIAG's view, I want you to think about this. The common law, as it's developed in the, in, in the United States, is the product of a subjugated people. The Anglo-Saxon law had overlain on top of it a Norman conquest law. And it developed in a way that brought together the best elements of Norman law and the best elements of Anglo-Saxon law to what I believe is the best legal system the world has ever known. It is not, however, a perfect legal system. And I know that tribal nations would hate to be called subjugated peoples, but the reality of it is what they bring to the table in this grand panoply of judicial systems is a great laboratory of justice that as we look at restorative models as we look at moving forward they provide us with opportunities to learn to know and to move forward um, in a way that that really is sort of mind-boggling all that being said not all tribal convictions are alike and there are some that frankly if you look at them it's the courts function in a way that is so foreign from the traditional Western model that it's difficult to really say, what does this conviction actually mean? The other thing is, is that, you know, some tribal governments are struggling. You know, these are small uh, uh, entities sometimes uh, without very good funding, with a long history of uh, internal dissension. They may have disparate clans that have been pushed together onto a, a piece of land by the federal government 100 years ago, and those clan differences continue to be a significant problem. And so the clan that's in uh, take, takes one position, a next clan wins the next tribal election, they take a different position. Files disappear sometimes in tribal courts. I mean, if you're the federal judge, you know what the tribes uh, courts look like in the district where you're serving, at least you ought to. And I think that the tools that we've put in place give us an opportunity to really uh, honestly evaluate the process uh, and to, to score those things in a way that makes sense. And I want to give uh, both Brent and Barbara an opportunity to respond to what I just said because however else you look at this, I am still a white guy talking about what goes on in Indian country and I think that frankly people that work in Indian country probably have a lot more to say than I do. I'd like to respond to it. I am a white guy working in Indian country. But um, if the question is whether that does due process uh, restraints have to be in place before considering an upward departure, my answer would be no. Uh, if it's an automatic, yes. But if you're talking about upward departure in Indian country generally uh, on that basis, um, it's deeply problematic. Crime is a serious problem in Indian country. And, and tribes have been hamstrung in their ability to hold people accountable with the Indian Civil Rights Act, even with the Tribal Law and Order Act. You can only sentence up to three years if it's murder, rape, whatever. And those cases get prosecuted in Indian country. 
it would be deeply disconcerting with somebody who has 10 prior very, very serious convictions out of a tribal court that uh, doesn't have those factors in place that, that uh, you might be used to. The other thing to consider is that I think, in my experience, tribal courts are much more truth-seeking than federal and state systems. They aren't as hung up on process and the importance of process. They want to get to what happened. And they're uh, much more uh, focused on trying to uh, come up with a conviction that, that tries to heal everybody. Um, so the fact that they don't look like the federal or state model does not mean that they don't guarantee due process within that community. It's understanding of what process is due and fair and reflects their cultural values and whatnot. I don't think you should discredit the convictions that come out of those simply because they don't look like what comes out of state and federal court, particularly if you're talking about upward departure. Um, That's what we're talking about. Oh, yeah, so. yeah. Uh, so no, I would not in any way make that a, a minimum factor. I think the problem that um, you're, you're listening to now with the question of due process and upward departure is that you're comparing apples and oranges. And tribal courts traditionally served a very different purpose than the crime and justice uh, punishment of the Western model, the adversary model. So when we start talking about how sophisticated a tribe is or how functional it is, it makes, it, there's a judgment calls that are denigrating the work of tribal courts. And we can't use that, that language. We have to look at the, the process that was due. That's why the compromise of treating the tribe as a foreign nation is ultimately the best idea um, to try to weigh this out because they're different. They're not United States courts. They're not Article III courts. And they're not, they even shouldn't be cared, compared to state courts. What I come down to with your question with regard to due process are two things. One is a valid conviction in tribal court is illegal, unconstitutional in the United States um, constitutional courts. That means that an un, a person, ha, I represented a man who represented himself against a law-trained prosecutor and got eight years in the tribal court order. Um, he was denied counsel. They didn't have an indigent defense uh, system, and there was no one that, there was no way he could get a, the note out from jail that he needed help. We didn't even know he existed until after um, he received his sentence. The second one is the racial disparity. Non-Indians don't have this problem. They will have, or at least be afforded, uh, counsel in state courts, municipal courts, or be able to hire one themselves. They can waive counsel, or they can um, go pro se by choice, but the judge is going to go through a panoply of questions and a colloquy about the rights that they're giving up. And so the racial disparity, even under the Violence Against Women Act, is really paramount. And something that we discussed is that non-Indians are guaranteed counsel in tribal court if they're facing prosecution, in tribal court, in order to make sure that non-Indian citizens' rights are the same in tribal, state, and federal. That's not true for Indians. Can I just ask you, where does, who, who appoints counsel for those people in tribal courts? Who's paying or funding the, the counsel representative? That was the question from the very beginning, like who's going to pay for this, right? They're separate sovereigns, but um, who pays for counsel? The tribe, it's the indigent defense counsel, and so the tribe, the government is, is um, required to provide that if they're going to have in, enhanced ten, sentencing or um, take on the special criminal jurisdiction in domestic violence not cases. not required for Indians? N only if they're going to seek a, lo a sentence longer than a year. So that's that zero to one year sort of gap um, that has been thrown by the wayside. Um, the idea that tribes have to do this because there isn't any other group that can do this is just wrong. Um, because the federal government does have jurisdiction in many of those cases, but they're not, they don't reach the level of a major crime or, or some, some kind of um, important uh, purpose in Indian country. And that's what we see a lot um, in Indian country, frankly, is that there aren't, we aren't statistically um, present enough um, 
to warrant the kinds of resources that are needed in these really difficult problems of, of crime and punishment that you all know very well. Just, just for background information, the ordinary jurisdictional limits of a tribal court is one year uh, unless they qualify for enhanced uh, sentencing abilities uh, under Toloa and VAWA, and then they can sentence up to three consecutive three-year terms. But generally speaking, if you get convicted in murder in a tribal court that doesn't qualify, you get one year, all right? Um, is the is a maximum sentence and so what happens in those courts that haven't complied and therefore are not qualified under these enhanced sentencing acts many of them um, um, provide there's a lot of a lot of lay public defenders uh, some no public defenders at all uh, and some law trained defenders and it's, it's just a very broad spectrum and so that's kind of the lay of the land and even in the court that we viewed in Standing Rock Sioux uh, where they had law trained prosecutor and a law trained defender, people were routinely pleading guilty to the charges without immediately um, after arraignment um, or without more because they were seeking drug treatment. And the judge was sentencing them to, if the 30 days or more, we were told they were allowed to go to county drug treatment. And so those are the kinds of things that you might um, see to, to deal with a, a caseload, but that conviction would be valid um, in the United States courts, but I don't know that it would be um, something, it, it needs to be something to look into and drill down to see what the circumstances were of those guilty pleas. And, and so what you do find in, in Standing Rocks, obviously, in North Dakota, you do find that people get sentences of longer than 30 days for the sole purpose of accessing drug treatment. Or you may see a sentence of banishment, which is something that you we don't really see um, uh, in a lot of places. And, uh, um, and uh, that's because of uh, the bad man language in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the Great Sioux Nation treaties, the Fort Laramie Treaty. Um, and so those sorts of things exist. Uh, uh, out there and so there are just some things that happen that that would be unusual and so the question is how exactly do you treat a banishment sentence if you're the judge I mean the conviction really is get out we've had enough of you okay and and what does that really mean you know? sounds good <laughs> <laughs> so no, on the it's... issue of, of people pleading without a public defender at arraignment to seek treatment and maybe uh, agreeing to uh, more than 30 days in order to get it. That's not unusual. Municipal and state courts, those sorts of things happen as well. Um, so that's not unique to Indian country. It happens all the time. Um, and, and I want you to consider those things. But I think fundamentally uh, the, the problem with putting too many restraints on looking at a tribal court conviction is that public safety in Indian country is a serious crisis, a serious problem, and if you can't treat somebody who um, uh, who engages in serious crime seriously, it's gonna happen again and again and again and again and again, and it does in Indian country all the time. As for cases that are very serious cases like rape, murder, those sorts of things, they're routinely not prosecuted by the federal government. Tribes are often the ones that are left having to deal with it. So they're very serious crimes. They aren't minor crimes. And, and they need to be considered whatever the process was. It needs to be considered. Doesn't mean the judge accepts it, but it needs to be considered. I have a question for the two judges. Um, I'm just curious. When you took the bench, it seems like there's so many details about these individual tribes that you need to know before you sentence an individual from the tribe. Does the FJC give you any particular training on the tribes? I mean, we could we could list all kinds of departure factors here, but we're really not gonna give the kind of guidance that judges needed need to make informed decisions without a lot of detail on all of these nuances that each of you have mentioned. And I can imagine there, you've mentioned hundreds, so you you really need some specialized training, don't you? There is no formal training uh, when becoming a district judge uh, in Indian law, even if you're in an Indian country jurisdiction. That is part of the reason why uh, several of us uh, discussed the possibility of uh, mentoring uh, incoming judges. Now, I, I will say that, uh, I'm not sure, Judge Erickson, if your experience was the same, but um, 
I'd lived in South Dakota nearly all of my life. I was I had represented a tribe. I was not terribly active in doing federal defense work, but uh, the existing judges were very helpful to me uh, in uh, understanding uh, the issues in Indian country sentencing. And of course, immediately it's a baptism by fire, at least where I am. Um, so I did come to appreciate those those. Um, issues uh, on the fly. But we've thought about uh, that, and uh, that's part of the reason why we've contacted the AO and the FJC about forming a working group. Judge. Yeah, um, I was fortunate. I grew up in a little town that's nestled between two separate Indian reservations in North Dakota, 30 miles uh, to the north. There's a, a, a Chippewa uh, reservation. 30 miles to the east, there's a Sioux uh, reservation. Uh, my mother's family were French Canadian uh, trappers and traders. Uh, my family's history with Native people goes back to the 1600s. Um, my family wouldn't be here but for their relationship uh, with Native peoples. And so there has never been a time in my life where I haven't been exposed uh, to Native peoples. That being said, completely unprepared for what happened with federal sentencing and tossed to the wolves. And it, I'm telling you, you know, um, Federal Indian country jurisdiction um, is complicated. Um, uh, I have a chart that I wrote out that I put on the bench uh, that just is shorthand as to who's a, who I've got jurisdiction uh, over and why. Uh, it still sits on the bench. I look at it far less frequently today than I did when I first started, but it was like fed to the wolves. I mean, it, it truly is. And um, um, for judges that sit in Indian country, they have a different level of attachment to uh, um, Indian country prosecutions. I was fortunate that uh, Judge Rodney Webb uh, had been around a long time, had been the U.S. attorney, was willing to mentor me. Um, I know that there are other judges, including judges on our committee, who literally walked into court, had no idea that they, uh, uh, what it meant to have jurisdiction uh, over Indian country and no one bothered to tell them anything, and they came out of baby judges school with like the same training that all of you had and just had to figure it out on their own. You go. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question about that fifth factor that you all um, listed about whether or not the tribal government has expressed a desire that their convictions should be counted. And I'm just curious how you get that information. I mean, what? how you would know what they're expressed and would they know what purpose it was going to be used for. So a judge trying to follow that particular factor, what would the process look like to get that information? I think we talked about that a little bit and I think we left it alone. I think each tribe is different and who you contact is different and what their expectations for the communication is different. So I think it's important to treat each tribe as what they are, separate sovereigns, uh, and deal with them individually. So I guess just to drill down a little bit on so, that, does that mean like, so if you had a, a, a court that didn't tell you about the conviction or that they don't want it used, is that their way of expressing don't use this? Or is there a kind of a formal mechanism that you find out the position is, is, is X? I'm just trying to figure out if it, this is how this would operationalize for It could be through consultation. A board could pass a resolution saying what its desire is one way or the other. Um, it could be any number of different ways. At, at Umatilla, we're working on uh, we have access to federal criminal databases, um, which most tribes don't. We're working on on trying to get our convictions in the NCIC and, and what have you, so that you will you'll have them automatically that way. But each tribe is different, and they're they're in different um, different expectations, different backgrounds, different cultures. Um, I think you need to approach them individually. From, from your experience and outreach for this group, do you have a sense of what percentage of those tribes that actually have the due process protections that our Constitution guarantees, what percentage of those would nonetheless say, don't count them? Do you have any sense from your survey and telephone calls, or did you not get in that kind of detail with them? Uh, there are relatively few tribes, my understanding, that have been certified in Tuloa or Bawa. I, I don't know. If you know Brent, how many? I think there's a little more than eight for each. Out of 566, 315 separate, or 316, I think, separate tribes. But, but of those um, eight, would they, I mean, by creating those due process protections, is it in part so that their convictions are considered or completely 
divorce from? It depends on the tribe. It, I mean, different tribes may have different opinions. Each of these tribes are, are unique, and the way that they approach their, their question of, of, of whether they want to qualify or don't want to qualify is, is a unique decision. And the reality of it is, for some, the driving force is, look, there are high declination rates on serious crimes by the United States attorneys. And, you know, um, that happens in a lot of places where the tribes are small, the districts are large, um, and um, the U.S. attorney does not see as one of their primary goals the prosecution of Indian country crime. Well, if you sit in North Dakota or South Dakota or Arizona, New Mexico, our U.S. attorneys understand and perceive that a big piece of what they do is the prosecution of Indian country crime. And, and there's a difference. So someone might say the enhanced sentencing penalties, they're, they're huge for us because, you know, we could have someone who is guilty of a sexual assault and attempted murder, and we can't get anyone to turn their head. And so we want to be able to sentence them to the longest sentence possible, and we're willing to provide those sorts of, of due process rights. Or they might look at it and just say, you know, we just are much more comfortable with a Western model, and we want to adopt that. Uh, on the flip side, you may have a very traditional um, Indian nation that says, you know, we're very comfortable with what we've done forever, and this represents our culture, our people, and we afford all the due process we believe is appropriate. And the penalties that we believe are appropriate are the penalties that we impose. And we don't need to look beyond our own culture and our own traditions. And so, you know, that's the, the sort of, I don't think you can infer anything um, uh, in any individual case without actually knowing the tribal uh, organizational structure and what the tribe is doing <laughs> and asking them why. And in the consultation process, you know, some federal judges um, are in regular contact with tribal judges and, and tribal chairs. Others, even with significant Indian country cases, uh, are uncomfortable with that. And so that consultation thing, I think that Part of what we've got to do is we've got to get the judges to understand that it's perfectly okay to consult with them. Just briefly, I would not think it the role of the federal judge to seek out the tribe to find out whether we should be counting their convictions or not. Ideally, I would foresee a tribal council vote, uh, probably uh, at the behest of the U.S. attorney, looking to see, well, uh, should we be making the argument that there should be upward departures here? from various uh, convictions in various tribes within the district. I would, I would think that practically is how it ought to work, is tribal resolution. Honor, is there's, there's no pettit policy that's applicable to tribal convictions, and there is, there is no avenue for tribes to um, divulge this information that you're asking. Um, so it would probably be up to the council or the probation. So we, we do need to wrap it up, but just so we don't want to lose protective orders for a minute. Yes. Is, is that a, a, what I didn't get a sense of, is I, I assume it's primarily sexual ass assault, the protective orders for domestic um, violence, is that primarily what we're talking about? The concern? Yeah. No. It no. could be just um, sexual assault versus regular assault or anything. So, so are protective orders across the span of the different tribal jurisdictions a common way of handling that? Is, is that why this is such a big issue for you? These are insular communities, and there's lots of people uh, that are closely connected, and they would not necessarily be family connections that you would that we would see. And there are protection orders that may sometimes be uh, put in place because of violence or threats of violence. Some of them would fit very neatly into a uh, the, the standard state definition of a, of a, a domestic violence protection order. Some of them would be um, um, pretty far removed. You know, um, being called a grandfather is an honorific title in many respects. It's a person who's obtained a certain age, who is closely related, acts as a mentor and guide. And so they would be viewed as part of the, this family structure being very close, but not uncommon for somebody to walk in and uh, have their third grandfather die. Um, and everybody looks and says, say what? And it's just the way it is. I mean, and so these protection orders may be recognizable in a sort of the traditional Western construct and may not. Just like the, the process that Judge Lang just described as to how you'd consult, that would be very common in some tribes that they would go about that. But I'm going to tell you that there are uh, tribal entities that exist in North Dakota where um, they do really expect that there is at least once a year that the federal judge will sit down and talk with the tribal chair and the 
Tribal Commission. It's the long tradition. It's been going on since the first federal judges were appointed, and it's uh, sort of an ordinary thing. Yes, I, I'm just trying to get, because that's one big recommendation is protective orders, and it makes sense, I mean, the, the definition, but why is it such a big deal? Is, is, it, is it a Your common Honor, way? In the materials that we were given from the Sentencing Commission staff, there was um, a memo that was prepared with in conjunction with um, the victim's advocacy um, group. And the idea was that um, how should tribal protection orders be handled in under the sentencing guidelines. And what we found was there just isn't any data. And so the question is sort of like tribal court convictions, like should they be um, given the same weight, should they be counted, should a violation of one uh, allow for or require an upward departure or an automatic enhancement uh, as a special um, characteristic or sentencing factor. And there just isn't the data. And so where we ended up was we, we looked and looked and looked, but all we could come up with was in order to understand the issue, we should at least define that tribal court protection orders um, are within that universe of protection orders that, that uh, are under 18 U.S.C. Um, 2265. Okay. Thank you. Is there any Is that right? I have one. I mean, I've got to tell you, the tribal court convictions piece um, concerns me. The um, protective orders, not, not as much. Mm -hmm. um, I'm concerned about uh, an application note that says no factor shall um, be determinative. These may be relevant, mm -hmm. but it's a host of factors. Um, it seems to me that it, it, it invites disparity. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that can be meaningfully reviewed uh, when it's um, applied. Um, do you have a reaction to yeah. that? You know, Judge Pryor, what I would say is the way it sits right now, you're asked to consider uh, tribal uh, court convictions when you feel it's appropriate. And uh, it provides no guidance. And I'm just telling you that as a federal judge who sits down uh, on the first day on the bench, boy, I would sure like to know what are the sorts of factors I ought to consider. There's no case law that's developed in this area. Um, it's just sort of if you do it, then the question is on review, is it an abuse of discretion? And once you get back from the appellate courts is, you know, the judge explains something, no abuse of discretion. If you say nothing and just do it, then they say, well, we can divine from the record that it makes some sense if they can, or they say, yeah, we don't get it. Try again, judge. Um, explain it. That's you know, mean, and though, isn't it, that similarly situated offenders are going to be treated dissimilarly? But they already are, and I think the way it is now... Shouldn't we do something to make that better? I mean... And, 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 uh, well, I think that this actually does make it better because it gives us a list of factors to actually look at and and and, and to work with. I mean, I think um, the, the the I, I just I just think that that it actually does provide some guidance to judges in Indian Country. It will take it uh, from being a purely arbitrary decision-making process to something with some structure, and it allows a, a decisional rubric. Uh, to move forward. Um, I continue uh, to just say that the, you could take this and make it a guideline and say this is where we're at rather than having it an application note. The issue there becomes is that if in fact there is a broad uh, problem with uh, uh, sentencing disparity already, it's going to aggravate it. Thank you. I think we, it's time for our break. I want to thank the panel very much. And um, we'll have 10 minutes, and we'll be back for the next panel. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. We've got to get to this next panel, um, uh, the, who will uh, discuss uh, recommendations from the Sentencing Sub Disparity Subcommittee and the Youthful Offender Subcommittee. First, Judge Jeffrey Viken is the Chief United States District Judge for the District of South Dakota, and he chaired the Sentencing Disparity Subcommittee for the... I say TIAG, you say TIAG? Whatever. Bob says TIAG, we all say TIAG. Okay. Uh, see, there are some things you didn't work out. So that, but that's, that's fine. And, and Kathleen Bliss um, Kwasula is a private practitioner from Las Vegas, Nevada, a commissioner for the Nevada Indian Commission, and a member of the Cherokee Nation. She served as chair of the Youthful Offenders Subcommittee 
Um, and of course, we still have um, Judge Erickson who will chime in. So thank you all for being with us. Do we start with you, Judge Viking? Or? Yes, thank you, Judge Saris. I appreciate it. And I, I do echo uh, Chief Judge Erickson's comments about the privilege it is to serve uh, on the Tribal Issues Advisory Group to the United States Sentencing Commission. Uh, the committee uh, that I chaired was charged with looking at sentencing disparities in Indian country jurisdiction. Uh, I had an extraordinary committee, and, and, and like Judge Erickson, it is uh, really the most extraordinary group of thinkers from disparate backgrounds uh, with which I have ever worked. I had uh, uh, Mike Cotter, the U.S. Attorney in Montana, of course, a major Indian country jurisdiction. Judge Robert Blazer, who's the chief judge of the White Earth Nation in Minnesota. Troy Ide, of course, who's been involved in VAWA and many other Indian policy issues nationally. And uh, Dr. Miriam Jorgensen, who is an extraordinary um, statistician. She's at the University of Arizona and is the uh, research director for the Native Nations Institute. And her understanding of and hard questions put with regard to the compilation of data and its utility uh, was critical. And then Kathleen Bliss uh, assisted us greatly. And, and uh, Professor Creel also participated in some of our conference calls. Our process was that we, uh, we did uh, meet by conference call uh, uh, at least monthly, and uh, and work through it that way. Now, uh, uh, let's start out with uh, I think a very important question that Judge Sarah's asked, in which our uh, committee was, uh, uh, I guess, uh, helpful in developing a solution. I do think on TIG there's a universal view that the United States Sentencing Commission should find a way, a method, a process to consult with Indian nations and tribes. One of the ways to do that as a practical matter, Judge Saris, is to adopt this uh, recommendation that there be a mini TIAG or an ad hoc tribal issues advisory group, which will continue on with a smaller group of members and the resources yet to be determined as to which most effective, but a group that can, with their experience and background and wisdom, go around to the native nations who are subject to the federal sentencing guidelines and consult and determine whether there are um, real or imaginary uh, positions with regard to sentencing disparities for Native people in federal courts, and whether or not uh, there's a real or imaginary uh, perception with regard to the handling of Native people from those tribes and nations in state courts. So when you think about a burglary being committed inside the boundaries of a county which is subject to Major Crimes Act jurisdiction, where I am, Oglala Lakota Nation County, uh, that you can walk five feet across the line and commit exactly the same offense as a Native person and be subject to state court jurisdiction only. No federal jurisdiction, no uh, tribal or, or um, federal jurisdiction. It would be tribal and federal jurisdiction within Indian country. And so the handling of these people uh, pr 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 just put forward some very fundamental questions. Um, you know, one could look at the application of the sentencing guidelines to Major Crimes Act jurisdiction in Indian country as an unhappy marriage. You've struggled here even this morning in our brief conversations with how do these systems fit together? And if the Sentencing Commission's Organic Act charges you in part with defining fairness in federal sentencing as the avoidance of disparity, you run into very specialized problems in dealing with Native nations and tribes. Uh, the fit is complicated, and the fix is not easy to identify. And so this consultation process is critically important. It's not only a treaty obligation for the United States government generally, but certainly if you're going to work on the sentencing of Native people under the Major Crimes Act and other federal uh, jurisdiction applying only to Indian country and members of tribes and people subject to federal jurisdiction in Indian country. That consultation is absolutely critical. That is a piece of your work which needs to be addressed, and that is a part of the loop that needs to be closed. And so we'd really, our committee, and I think Ty generally would, would encourage you. If we define um, fairness and sentencing in part, uh, as uh, avoiding disparities, the treatment of like uh, offense behavior uh, differently under different circumstances. I have to tell you that um, our group, uh, looking at sentencing disparities, cannot bring to you much guidance uh, beyond what was provided to you in 2003. Here we are 13 years later. You had a report in 2003 advising the commission 
that the data did not exist in order to make comparisons which would be reliable enough or deep enough that you could formulate guideline or policy or commentary language. And we come to you now and uh, again uh, say to you that this is the reality. Um, let's just look at the first component of that. We are in no position uh, as an advisory group or you as a commission even to compare potential disparities or real disparities in the sentencing of native people under federal criminal jurisdiction in federal courts, just in federal courts. So when we think of Arizona, New Mexico, Montana, North and South Dakota, and the other uh, districts which have su substantial federal Indian country jurisdiction, we have no ability to compare the sentences between what Judge Erickson and I are doing or what Brian Morris, a judge in Montana, or Dana Christensen in Montana, what we're doing. Why is that? Because when uh, we submit our judgment and order of conviction and our statement of reasons, nowhere is there demographic data with regard to, did this person fit the legal definition of an Indian? Well, if it's an 1153 offense, Major Crimes Act offense, they did. All right, but unless uh, uh, the United States Probation Office starts putting in pre-sentence reports, um, I'm told, uh, that identifies 1153 Indian Country jurisdiction. Your staff at the commission has no way to compile data even on the sentencing of Native people under the federal sentencing guidelines on Indian Country offenses. We are not there. And so we've made specific recommendations as to the type of data which should be compiled so that we can determine even within our own federal sentencing system, whether disparities exist between the districts. It seems to me that would be a fundamental uh, a, a goal uh, for the commission uh, to address. Now, to accomplish that, we've made some recommendations, uh, working with the judicial conference committees, working with United States probation, seeing that the appropriate data for jurisdiction in Indian country is com compiled so it can be compared. The only time uh, it's been done, in, in, uh, certainly in recent history, uh, was the special coding project for the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization. There, the jurisdictional data was compiled and it could be, uh, it could be uh, used as a database. So beyond that, um, we then looked at uh, the, the much more complicated issue of what about the perception in Indian country uh, that <laughs> A uh, native person is treated differently in state court as opposed to federal court for sentencing purposes for the same or very similar criminal conduct, assault, burglary, larceny, okay? Basic offenses, because the Major Crimes Act, of course, removed from the sovereign nations uh, the power to prosecute rape, murder, manslaughter, you know, the whole list of Major Crimes Act uh, offenses. So uh, the tribes uh, uh, may have their own authority over that, but the federal Government has exclusive jurisdiction with regard to felony uh, sentencing of more than a year in prison. So what do we do with that? Well, what happens is we're even in a, a less uh, helpful position in 2016 than we were in, in 2003. Um, states are not compiling data. Arizona and New Mexico, very significant Indian country jurisdiction with large numbers of native people subject to federal jurisdiction are keeping no records with regard to uh, 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 whether a person would qualify as an, uh, an Indian person for purposes of federal jurisdiction so that a comparison could be made. Um, you'd think the correctional system might have demographic information on the people being incarcerated in Arizona and New Mexico. Not true. There's actually nothing. And so Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Oregon, provided what data was available. But of course, what we found was, for your purposes, it would be an insufficient and unreliable database from which to draw any conclusions. Uh, that leaves you in a very unfair position. And our committee made some specific recommendations. Now, um, I think it's easier to deal with how do you create a database to avoid sentencing disparities or study the issues among federal sentences involving federal Indian country jurisdiction. When you get on the state side, you have, what, I think something like 34 uh, districts uh, that have significant Indian country jurisdiction. They all have their own state laws. They all have their own sentencing systems. Some of them have guidelines. Some of them are do, do not. So to ask the question is necessarily to invoke the reality 
that there are sentencing disparity issues which are very hard to study. Now, um, can it be done? Well, if the states would compile the data necessary uh, for uh, the United States Sentencing Commission to uh, develop databases and proper analysis, then yes, we could have comparisons as to whether Native people are treated differently in federal and, uh, and state court for the same or similar uh, conduct. Uh, we're in no position to do so for a lack of data. The recommendations would include something that some people uh, would uh, perhaps consider a bit far-fetched. It would take an act of Congress, of course, to tie federal funding for uh, correctional systems or law enforcement in the states, the federal money flowing out to the, uh, to the states, and to put in there a requirement that data be compiled so that at least we know in the United States what's going on with regard to this aspect of sentencing in the states and our ability to compare it to, uh, to federal sentencing. Now, whether that's uh, practical or not um, is something that uh, certainly um, the Commission can consider. And we've made other recommendations to try to accomplish those things. But um, uh, to say that, uh, um, that we were surprised uh, from our various backgrounds on the committee to find that this data did not exist, that would be an understatement. Uh, we were very demanding. Professor Jorgensen had a wide range of ideas on what should be compiled and how it could be analyzed. Um, uh, and much of that, notwithstanding the intellectual effort, uh, did not uh, take us anywhere. Um, this will not be an elegant process. If you're going to start comparing a state sentencing data and outcomes with the wide, wide range of sentencing alternatives available to state judges, and try to compare it to the federal system, you're going to run into a, a very significant problem unless uniformity uh, can be uh, accomplished in the way it's uh, compiled. And then, of course, uh, and, and Kevin Blackwell, who was extraordinarily helpful to us, pointed out that the elements of a federal statute and the elements of a state statute, um, they don't match perfectly. And so one can always take the position that the data is unreliable because the elements of the offenses that we're studying don't match exactly. Exactitude is not going to work on many levels for you when you're in Indian country. It, it simply uh, will not. It is an alternative uh, historical reality uh, and a form of federal jurisdiction that will present challenges to you that you will find nowhere else in the federal sentencing system. And so um, we present our report to you. We uh, strongly encourage consultation and uh, serious consideration of what TIAG has come forward uh, with uh, uh, for your future consideration. Before there are any questions, there is one thing that I think you probably are, are, are concerned about, and that is the idea when we talk about, you know, comparison to state court convictions, it seems like, well, that's a sort of a run-of-the-mind question that we've already moved beyond for uh, everyone else in the system, that state sentences are different than federal systems. That's just a reality of separate sovereigns. So why does it matter in Indian country? It matters in Indian country for two fundamental reasons. First of all, the Major Crimes Act took away the jurisdiction of the tribes to deal with these, these crimes that were traditionally matters that were left to the states. Second of all, many prosecutions occur under the Assimilative Crimes Act and under the Assimilative Crimes Act, we actually absorb the state crime and the state elements to that crime, and we try them in federal court. So in federal court, I try felonies that are just run-of-the-mind street crime that nobody else tries. And that's why I have the best job for a federal judge anywhere uh, as a trial judge, is that I continue to try ordinary street crime like I did as a state trial judge, and I have all of the usual and customary federal question cases as well. But the reality of it is, is that if you think about this, and it happens in cases, it's happened in a case, Norquay, which I think is a 1990 case out of the Eighth Circuit, where a white man and an Indian man commit a crime jointly. The Indian man tried in federal court gets a sentence that's twice as long as his co-defendant who's tried in state court. And you know what? You end up in situations where grandmothers come to me and they stand in front of me and says, why did my son go to prison or my grandson go to prison for longer than uh, those white boys did? You know, and there is no profoundly good answer to that question. 
Okay. And so yeah. the reason why it matters is just the fundamental justice of it all, and particularly with the Assimilative Crimes Act. I mean, I'll just tell you the strangest thing I've ever tried. At one point, I tried um, a uh, felony DUI uh, case. I mean, it's like, really? Who knew you did that in federal court? Um, but it can happen. Um, let's see. Good afternoon. Uh, the Juvenile and Youthful Offenders uh, Subcommittee was tasked with uh, the responsibility for looking at the impact of the sentencing guidelines on youthful offenders um, because, as we know, juveniles, those under the age of 18, the sentencing guidelines don't apply unless that juvenile then is transferred to adult status. Um, so what I'm going to address with you are some specific recommendations that we're making um, and then also the weight of the Sentencing Commission to make some recommendations to the executive branch as well as the legislative branch. First, though, I want to give you a little bit more background about uh, this particular subcommittee. Um, we were comprised of probation officers, United States probation officers. Um, Lori Baker was our most recent member. Rick Holloway, uh, a senior probation officer who worked in South Dakota, had enormous experience, retired, but a member of uh, the probation officers advisory group. Uh, Rick was, was incredibly significant in his voice that he loaned to us. Uh, into this report and some of the recommendations because he saw it from the ground. We also were so fortunate to have Eric Shepard from uh, the Indian Affairs section of the Solicitor's Office and Angela Campbell. I can't tell you how wonderful it was to work with her too because Angela Campbell has actually, uh, she was a federal public defender prior to going into private practice. She's also su successfully litigated before the United States Supreme Court. She's responsible for the Burrage decision, or also pronounced as Barrage, according to Mr. Barrage. Um, a little bit more background about myself. I was a federal prosecutor for 22 years. I served in the US Attorney's offices for the Northern District of Oklahoma, where I started, District of New Mexico, where I predominantly prosecuted Indian country cases and was a tribal liaison, both there as well as um, Northern District my last 12 years were in the District of Nevada, where I was with the Organized Crime Strike Force. Um, I've been in private practice now um, as a criminal defense attorney, so I've changed positions, new hat, uh, same constitution. Um, and uh, that, that has given me uh, yet another perspective. I also want to say that um, my husband, Ted Quisula, was a member of the Toloa Commission. He was a commissioner appointed by President Obama, along with Troy Ide, he was the chair. Within the Toloa Commission, which I think its report with unbelievable consultation in person through regions of the United States. So if you haven't read that report, I think it's a good context for you. But Miriam Jorgensen was also a key member of the working group that helped write uh, the Toloa report. There's an entire chapter that's devoted to juvenile justice. Um, a very disconcerting, if not um, demoralizing chapter. Well, the federal government probably deals with juveniles more than anyone else, um, any other body. Um, and I, I neglected to say another incredibly key member of our group was Chairman Dave Archambault, who is the chairman of Standing Rock, one of the Indian nations we visited and observed. He, too, gave us a very personal and unique perspective into the formation of the recommendations that we're giving to the commission. Um, that said, uh, Juveniles, uh, even though the, the sentencing guidelines don't apply to juveniles, juveniles encompass 98% of federal prosecution. It's, it's very high as far as juveniles go. I personally prosecuted 
a lot of juveniles, transfer them to adult status for in unbelievably heinous crimes. Um, but we had to go beyond that to really address what we saw was the important situation here. And that was to expand it into considerations by the sentencing judges as to youthful offenders. And so here's what we came up with. We all know that juveniles and youthful offenders are different. They have different brain development. They have different life experiences. And especially when you're talking about Indian country, there are different cultural, social, traditional values that should not be disrupted, if at all possible, because of the effect. We also know from the studies that we cited in our report that when you sentence a youthful offender to a term of imprisonment, you've got to look at the impact of that detention or term of imprisonment. Because based upon the studies that we saw, gasp, you're almost guaranteeing recidivism. So we want our recommendations to actually be looked at as having an effect and the impact on the the disposition of conduct of what occurred with that juvenile or youthful offender. So here's what we came up with, if I may, just kind of rattle it off very quickly. We're, we're actually asking for a modification to um, the, off, the offender characteristics that would be contained in um, Chapter 5, H1.1. And we laid it out on page 33 of the report. And we added in our recommendations to modify the language. We're, instead of looking at age as something that requires a combination of factors, that you can look at age alone, so long as it's consistent with 18 U.S.C. Section 3553, because, of course, the nature of the offense, things like that, are, are going to be uh, something that we we believe we shouldn't fall back from, but also look at these uh, pro-social behaviors, activities, relationships, things like that that I, I just mentioned. So that would be in Chapter H. So we're also asking for a new departure basis. So in 5K, it would be 2.25 where there's actual a basis for a sentencing judge to depart downward based upon a youthful offender, given the factors that we have there. So those are the two specific provisions that, that we're recommending the commission look at and modify or add in the case of 5K 2.25. Additionally, we would like the weight, the brilliance, the power of the commission to make recommendations to those who do have the power to, to address whether or not a prosecution is going to be one that asks for a term of imprisonment under the guidelines. And that is to ask the executive branch, specifically the United States Attorney's offices, to expand their view, and your answer, oh, <laughs> where's your hand? <laughs> to expand your, right over here. <laughs> to expand the view on pretrial diversion. Okay, all right. So I was an assistant U.S. attorney. I've actually done pretrial diversions. Okay, you go to other offices. It's just something that's unheard of. It's something that's just not done. So we would like a little urging. Um, that would, would show a pretrial diversion under certain circumstances is appropriate with a youthful offender. Again, we're looking at what is the impact of that sentence. And so pretrial diversion is one of those options. Also, we are asking that the commission take a look at, and I know that this stems from recommendations by the professional 
working group as well as the POAD. And that would be to simplify the, the uh, sentencing table where there would be alternatives to incarceration and you would have a section A and then B as opposed to four A, B, C, and D. So anything under A would allow the sentencing judge to impose a sentence of imprisonment <coughs> or a combination of different means of sentencing that particular defendant based upon such factors as the youth, socioeconomic ties, tradition, culture, et cetera. So the two, two zone is something. I, it's either, I'm making you guys go cuckoo. Yeah. <laughs> that would be uh, Sorry, that's my, that's my problem. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> It's uh, actually a commentary on some of my judicial <laughs> Okay. Um, then finally, uh, one thing that would be a legislative fix, and it, this, this does then go back into the consultation um, and the, the need for recon, recognition of tribal consultation, and that's to actually fix the Juvenile Delinquency Act, which is 18 U.S.C. Section 5032. Taloa also made a very strong recommendation uh, to Congress for this fix. And what it does is it, it basically adds a certification that the U.S. attorney um, has consulted with the tribe about what to do with the kid. Um, that's the requirement with state authorities. States don't have jurisdiction um, for the most part over these crimes. so. The tribe should should be able to weigh in, and we we made that consultation not with the tribal council. We're very specific about it with the prosecuting authority of that particular tribe. U.S. attorneys' offices uh, could accomplish this pretty easily because since 1994, um, Attorney General Janet Reno uh, required U.S. attorneys' offices to create a position of tribal liaisons. I know I was one of the first ones being in Oklahoma. So it's been around for a long time um, as far as the U.S. Attorney's Office ability to consult. Thank you so much. I know it's hard right before lunch. My stomach's growling. <laughs> I'll say a few things. Um, yes. Thank you uh, for your, um, first of all, for your recommendation about the pretrial diversion, because you okay. may or may not know the department is definitely focused on that. You're preaching yeah. to the choir a little bit. We're really interested in those types of programs, and we're trying to replicate them and, and multiply them around the country. Um, I do also want to note that, as you know, the, the the executive office of U.S. Attorney does have the, have the tribal liaisons. It's, it's um, They've always been very focused on it, and we are we're honored here today to have some representatives of the, of that office who came here to express their support for the TIAG and the work that you've done. Um, and as you know, always want to hear from you, whether or not through the TIAG or outside the TIAG, as to the issues and, and different experts on it. Um, but if I can go beyond that a little bit, it's been um, stated and restated by now a few times in the last couple of hours. But I, I also wanted, on behalf of the department, to thank the TIAG or the TIAG um, for the impressive and very important work that you've done. Um, I've been in my long <laughs> department career in policymaking. I've been part of many, many groups. And, and I think it's, it's really special what we've heard as to how this group has come together, especially keeping in mind what everybody's noted, that it came from such a diversity of backgrounds and opinions and the fact that they were diametrically opposed um, positions on some things and that you've all come together with the report and recommendations that you all support, I think is very impressive. And, and we're just, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, and we're very, very grateful to, to everyone that participated, to the commission for putting it together, to Nicole, who's, who's everybody lauded as, as sort of the, the 
engine behind it. Um, so, so I just wanted to put that for the record, how, how thrilled we are. And, and we're sorry that um, our members to the side couldn't be here, Director of Tribal Justice Tracy Tolu and U.S. Attorney Mike Cotter. But, we, but again, we've been in communications with them, and they, it's just everyone to a fault have spoken so highly of how this group has come together that, um, again, it, you've been congratulated a lot already, but you can always use more. Um, uh, I was going to uh, jump in and ask you, um, Judge Viking. So, what do we? Some of this data is not within our control. And uh, so what's your recommendation as to what we can do uh, in terms of not the federal to federal, but the state data, so that we're not back here in another decade with you know with the same report saying, "Gee, we told you ten years ago we couldn't do this." Um, Judge Harris, unless um, a uniform system can be developed requiring the states to compile the data necessary for the Sentencing Commission to conduct the type of analysis to determine sentencing disparities of the states, um, we're going to be in the same position 10 years from now. now what could what what we thought through from our different backgrounds was the only real tie to the states in their correctional systems and their justice systems is federal money and congress of course accomplishes many things in this society by connecting um, a sensed federal need for information with the provision of federal resources and that's why our recommendation recommendation tied together a requirement that states provide the data. And of course, you have a very skilled staff that can identify, and work with Professor Jorgensen or others, to identify exactly what type of data you need to compile so that the request isn't overly burdensome. Whether the states would want something with regard to their ability to develop systems within their states to provide the data, those are all policy issues. Um, and those are matters that this commission would have to uh, to raise with Congress if you're serious about compiling it. But until you do so, um, no group, advisory group, is going to come forward with uh, reliable information of the type of empirical data the Commission uses to make its policy and guideline uh, judgments. But when it, what Judge Erickson said is true. I mean, I often hear the complaints in Massachusetts here that the federal sentences are so much tougher than the state sentences, and it resonates in many states, I think, across the nation. But the, but the strength of the argument is the strongest of these, I guess, assimilative crimes. Is, is, that would be, is there a way of studying that subgroup of crimes where the, really the concern of disparity is its, it's peak? You know, it normally is a state crime, but you're picking up the crime and you're trying it in federal quarters. So is there, would there be a way of um, us facilitating a study of, of that subgroup of crimes? And we, I don't even know how many there are of them, uh, really, as a practical matter. Well, uh, look. Um, if you, if you undertake that task, we have to begin with the reality that, for example, just take Arizona and New Mexico, major Indian country districts and states with large native populations. Their justice systems and their courts and their state governments mm -hmm. are not even determining whether a native person, non-native person, Hispanic or African-American person was the subject of sentencing. The, the demographic data is, uh, is absent. There is none. And so for you to make uh, yeah. any sort of determination, for example, on a state assimilated crime, take burglary, for example, there's no federal definition. We look to state law. Um, you take the, uh, you know, the state definition of burglary. One would think we could compare federal sentences under the Assimilated Crimes Act for burglary in federal court and compare it in the same district, Arizona or New Mexico, um, the state in which the district resides, with the sentencing data for burglary. You can't determine, because there is no data, uh, if an Indian person was involved in the state sentencing, whether the Indian or Native person involved fit the definition of an Indian person for purposes of federal jurisdiction. Uh, you, can't, you can't begin, uh, uh, because you don't have that information. I, I, I think it would be a mistake to get overly concerned about the states having different elements of something as fundamental as burglary or larceny. Um, you know, you could always throw a barrier up as a statistician and say there's no reliable data for the commission to consider because the elements don't match perfectly. I think that's a false uh, approach to the, to the uh, compilation of analysis of data. 
But that's how fundamental the question is under the Assimilated Crimes Act, Judge Sarris. Yeah, I'm just trying to get my handle around what we can do about it. Is, uh, what does it okay. You don't want us to? Sort of maybe writing, yeah. a, a, asking, uh, the, was it, there must what be the, committees in Congress the, to focus on this, to, to ask them to. Well, how about the Department of Justice, the Bureau of um, uh, Statistics and the Department of Justice? Well, well, there isn't any information because the states don't provide it. They, they can only deal with the data that flows to them from the states. And if the Indian country uh, uh, jurisdiction states aren't providing the data to the Department of Justice, there can be no compilation. That's where we are. Well, one of my great fears about disparity, if you don't ever develop any kind of statistical basis to understand what's going on, and we never answer this question, and there continues to be this sort of disparity, one of the uh, perceived problems uh, and anecdotal problems in Indian country is because the sentences in federal court are so harsh that uh, information that should be being sent on to the Department of Justice uh, for review for question of prosecution just never gets there. That the local law enforcement community tries to fix it as best they can because as they see the alternative is we get a sentence in tribal court that's six months to a year and it's something um, or if we send them off to, uh, to for federal prosecution they're going to get seven years which is twice what they would serve in state court and they're going to serve 85 percent of the sentence um, and there is no parole, and there's no diversion, meaningful diversion programs, and there's no deferred prosecution or uh, deferred imposition of sentence programs, all of which exist in great numbers in states. And it contributes to a low level of lawlessness on the reservations, which is a huge continuing problem on some Indian nations, or in some Indian nations, right? And, you know, once again, we can't say this is a blanket problem, but if you talk to people in Indian country, there's a sort of, we throw up our hands because our choice is we send our children away for, a, you know, the better part of a decade, or we treat it like it's a misdemeanor. It's a hard choice, and people are making it every day, although very few people, very few people will stand up in public and say that's a decision they're making. I mean, I, anecdotally, we hear that happens. Um, there, um, to paraphrase kind of a yogiism, ain't nobody talking about it today. You know, I mean, it's it's just kind of how it is. I think. On the, on the juvenile, where's the closest? Where are the juvenile facilities? Is part of this that they're sent so far away? Um, well, yes, that's always been a concern, and uh, I, I think it's relatively fluid, uh, but there. Typically, um, based upon a contract uh, with the Bureau of Prisons, so they're private facilities that are operating under contract. And when I was in New Mexico, that was always a, a very uh, deep concern uh, about the, you know, these these youth being um, hauled off so far. Uh, Devil's Lake, that was always, you know, something that, that struck fear is that there, the kids go into Devil's Lake. There was a facility for a while, I know, outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. It seemed to be operating pretty well because they, they actually understood um, Indian country to some extent. Um, and there, uh, the federal judge in sitting in Santa Fe that I've got to give great uh, praise to Judge Martha Vasquez was one of the first judges who actually went to that juvenile facility and took a look at it to make sure that they were actually doing what they said that they would be doing. I don't even know if it exists anymore, but they're very few. And so that's another, yet another reason for not only with juveniles, but even if you have a youthful offender, if you're talking about a kid from Indian country, there's no federal facility in New Mexico. You're going to go probably to Stafford, Arizona. But that's still going to be so far away if you're talking about um, Hickorya, which is over by the Colorado border. 
Um, so, and then of course designations are by the Bureau of Prisons as to where that person's going to go. So that's why we want the commission to look at the impact. What is the impact of the sentence if I, if I impose a sentence to a term of imprisonment? on this youthful offender, especially a first-time offender, especially a nonviolent offender. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the youthful offenders are going to be committing crimes of violence, but what is the context with, when, with, that, with which that occurred? Excuse me. So yes, that, that's definitely something for consideration. In our report, we cite two facilities for juveniles. Uh, one in, uh, in Idaho, and then um, I, I can't recall where the other one is, Devil's Lake. But um, it's, uh, it, they're very few and far between. But it's not that common, I don't believe, for juveniles, those under the, uh, under the age of 18, to actually be sentenced to a term of incarceration. That's, that's the 18. The most violent of the violent. Right. And then, if it's the most violent of the violent, depending on their age and what their prior criminal history is, then it's probably a situation where you want to move to transfer uh, that juvenile. Uh, if a juvenile has a prior predicate, it may be a mandatory transfer. So it doesn't happen that much that juveniles except the most violent offenders. Well, you know, yes, they are the, incarcerated. there's kind of a constant state of flux with these juvenile facilities. Um, and the reality of it is, you know, I want you to think about what she just said. They take people from New Mexico and send them to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. That's a thousand miles away from home. These are people who maybe have never, ever been a hundred miles away from their homes before. Um, they're completely isolated from their cultural group. They're completely uh, isolated from their families. I mean, this is not an ideal situation for rehabilitation under any circumstances. And even in North Dakota, you know, it is not infrequent for us to have kids that are taken from Belfort, North Dakota, and sent 600 miles away. All right? And um, when we say they're the violent, the most violent offenders, that, that's, that's true. But, but they're still juvenile type offenses sometimes. I mean, the reality of it is, I want you to, there are no, no juvenile drug treatment centers. I mean, if you think about it, you may have a tribe that has 6,000 people, it's a sovereign nation. It ought to have the full panoply of uh, protections and social services that a state would have. They may have limited access. Uh, if at all, into the state uh, uh, mental health and mental treatment state uh, situation. So if I get a sex offender in North Dakota, it is not uncommon for them to be sent 600 miles away. And you may have a 15, 16-year-old kid where I'm the judge. I have to decide um, um, in, in, like, you know, they're, they're terrible cases. I mean, like, say, a fondling case involving a 6-year-old sister and a 15-year-old boy. Well, we've got to make a choice. It's like, what do we do next? I mean, we take this 15-year-old kid, we send him 700 miles away to the nearest place where they'll provide that kind of sex offender treatment, or do we try and cobble something together that we can kind of make work in the state court and move him in with his auntie or his, his, his uncle and see what happens next? And, and I'm telling you, this is not an easy day for Ralph. I mean, and, and I'm sure it's not for anybody who does this kind of work. I mean, you're sitting there and... And, and there is no magic wand, and that's true in a lot of federal cases, but it breaks your heart when you're looking at a 15-year-old kid. I know we're running late here. Does anyone else? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Judge Erickson is going to wrap up, right? Yeah, well, I'm wrapped up. I just want to say, <laughs> I want to say thank you very much. I apologize for talking too much. It's in my nature. Well, let me just say this: that it's, uh, it's you fulfilled everything that we wanted when we set you up, and I know how hard you worked, and given us a lot of food for thought. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.